So confession time this morning. Um, I feel a little bit old. I didn't mean to feel old, but I picked my first sermon illustration, and then after the fact, I realized it's 25 years old, and I felt old because I remember when TV was good. Does anyone remember when TV was good? There used to be good shows, and then one show came along and spoiled it all. It was 1999. The name of that show was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You remember this? Back then, a million dollars was worth a lot of money. Actually, it was worth a million dollars, but that was actually something. And it was being offered on one show. You could become a millionaire instantly. If you wanted it, if you were smart enough, you could do it. But this show brought in reality television. And for the next 25 years, television as we know it would be dominated by reality television. Everything came from this big brother. I, I want to blame the internet for this show, but it gets worse because the next show came along and the next show is called Survivor. I will never forgive this show for giving the phrase playing the game a permanent part of my brain. But I know that phrase. If you don't know that phrase from the show Survivor, you're lucky, but you're unlucky because I have to explain it because it's my sermon illustration. So Survivor, the idea was you took a bunch of ordinary people and you put them on a remote island. The very first season I think was in Borneo. And they had limited food, limited water. They had to make their own shelter. They actually had to do work in harsh conditions. And they had to help their team live somewhat comfortably on the island. And guess what? They rated, every, they rated each other on how well they were helping the team, what a good job they were doing, and also on how popular they were. And every once in a while, they'd get together in their tribal council and they'd vote out the people that they didn't like, or perhaps they'd vote out the people that they liked too much. Because at the very end, you had the final three survivors, and everyone would get together and say, who did the best job of surviving and playing the game? And one person, again, would win a lot of money. Because are we surprised that at the end it came down to winning some money? But it had this phrase, playing the game. And love-hate relationship with playing the game, because playing the game means sometimes backstabbing. Sometimes it means telling lies. Sometimes it means being good at the physical competitions that they spread throughout the show. I mean, sometimes it just meant doing a good job and being a good friend and talking to people and supporting people. But often there was always this aspect of a popularity contest. And this is a show from that generation, but I think in every generation, we can recognize playing the game. I think in every high school that we went, that we went to, you can ask the question, what sets me apart from everybody else while I'm finding who I am in high school? Who do I want to be? What is my identity? Can I get it in a watch? Can I get it in a car? You can get a quote from the ancient Greeks that you can find on the modern internet about fitness, saying, a physical great physique is something nobody can buy. You can only earn it through hard work, so it's the most important thing. Right? You can just look at the urns that they painted back then and realize that the game was alive and active at every phase in human history. Who's the fastest? Who's the strongest? Who's the best? How do, I, how do I get better? But there's, a, there's an aspect of the game which isn't just about ourselves. There's an aspect of the game where when we're playing it with other people, we look at them and we say, how can they help me get what I want? How can they help me feel good about myself? I like this person because I feel good when I'm around them. 
I like this person because I think that they've played the game really well and I want to learn from them. I like this person because I want what they have. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift to see people as the wonderful people that God has made us and to give thanks for one another and to pour out thanksgiving to people, to God for people and say, ah, God, that person is so wonderful. I love them and I'm so grateful for them. But it's entirely something else to look at someone and say, I think they can help me get what I want. And usually we won't put those words on it, but we'll do it almost naturally because we learn to play this game from the very youngest age. And James, in our passage this morning, which um, we haven't read through yet, but James is talking about favoritism. And James has this verse to say, I'll pull one verse from it as our introduction, because I think this is at the heart of what James is trying to say. He says this, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And James wants to make it perfectly clear that this game, as we know it, doesn't have a place within God's church. God doesn't play this game, and he doesn't want us to play it. Just hold the slide for a moment. I'll read our passage for us. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This is James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. For if a man wearing a gold ring, I actually have a gold ring on today. If a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the other person, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are, conv and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but, fall but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor, transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So James wants to address something that he's seen in the church, where the church showed preference to someone just because they were rich and they had money. And worse than that, they dishonored someone because they didn't have money. And James says, if you, if you dishonor someone for that, you haven't understood God's law. This all is backed, and for James, it really is backed by a change of identity. And I'm thrilled that we get to look at this passage when we have a baptism. Because when we talk about baptism, we talk about dying to our old life being baptized, going into the water as a, as a metaphor in part for drowning and coming up alive in a new life and picking up a new life and new identity. And for James, the instructions he's giving is not just about behavior, but about understanding who we are in our new identity. And there are three aspects of the new identity that I want to draw out this morning that James highlights. The first 
is that now in our new identity, we are not competing against one another. The first aspect of our new identity is that we are family with each other. We're not foes. Now, there might be some competition within some families, but let's see what James is getting at. I've compiled a hit list of James's greatest hits of introduction, and so he's got some great lines here. Because James really wants to drive home the fact that we are family. So look at these. These are from James chapter 1 and 2. Count it all joy, my brothers. Let the lowly brother boast. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. My brothers, show no partiality. Listen, my beloved brothers. James wants to draw out the point, we're not the enemy. We're not called to compete with one another. And um, he goes a little bit further with this. After talking about the brothers, he tells the story of the rich man and the poor man. And uh, if we can get the next, uh, next slide. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, are these brothers or are these people who have been objectified? Are they, are they being treated as their clothes? And James, in his instruction, is pulling out for the church, we have a very basic choice. We can choose to love people or we can choose to judge them. And because we are ourselves fallen people, when we judge them, we will judge them wrongly according to the game that we're so used to playing. And James is actually reading his Bible through the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, because he's quoting a couple passages from there. And if you go to Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19 says, you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. There's nothing wrong in the book of Leviticus with assessing your neighbor fairly. But if you go further in the book of Leviticus, you're going to see in Leviticus 18, uh, chapter 19, verse 18, what James continues, which is the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. That's not a New Testament commandment. That's an Old Testament commandment. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. The moment we say of someone else, you are not worth loving, we have already judged them wrongly. We don't have all the time in the world to do everything for every single person. We, don't, we can't fix everyone's problems, but within the time and space that we're given and within the people that God has given to us, we are called to love them. We're called not to judge them, but we're called to love them. And James pulls this out. All of this, of course, is grounded in the new identity that we have. The call not to judge is most important because of something that God has done for us. It's expressed in the book of Galatians this way. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for, oh, sorry, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse, talking about our new identity when we're baptized, is a truth for the church that when James sees favoritism going on in the church, he says it cannot stand against this truth because God has decided when he brings people into his church, he doesn't care what your ethnic background is. 
He doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. He doesn't care if you are young or old. He has decided, I am going to love you rather than judge you. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die for each of us from all our ages and background and social status, no matter where we come from. He makes the decision, rather than judge you, I want to love you. And he says, this is now, when you are baptized, this is now your new identity, is to love as brothers rather than judging. And so what might seem to be, I'm sure for the church at the time, it was just according to the ordinary social rules that they were just doing what seemed appropriate. Oh, of course you have to honor this person because of their status. You have to. But James is trying to pull out for the church your family now. And the aspects of treating people according to the game, it's just so easy. It's just so easy to see someone who's wealthy and successful and say, I want what they have and try and cozy up to them. Which brings us to the second aspect of who we are in Christ now, is that we're called to be faithful not fickle. And James is going to draw out for us that now we have new winning criteria, no longer watches or, or cars or anything, but our new winning criteria and our new definition of what it means to survive in this world has been completely transformed by Jesus. And he gives it to us in the first verse. In some translations, it will talk about those who believe in Jesus, all you believers in Jesus. But in the, in the English Standard Version that we're using this morning, he has this wonderful phrase, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. And part of our new identity is holding the faith. He's now addressing the church, you are holders of the faith. He's already talked in, in, uh, in chapter 1 about how you should count it joy when trials come. He's already talked in chapter 1 about how wealth is fickle, that like a flower, it sprouts up, but then it fades. I've been going to uh, the Van Dusen Gardens this year in, in Vancouver, and the flowers have a cycle. I've gone to see the roses about three times and they're not there yet. I, I need to go again. But I've seen other flowers come up and go and they're really, some of their lives are really, really short. And you can see them at their tail end of their, of their lives when their, their petals are dropping and you're like, yeah, they ran their course for this year, it's done. And wealth is fickle like that and James wants to really make the point that now we need to assess what our purpose is in our new identity, and our purpose is all around faith. He wants to make the point that wealth goes away really quickly, that wealth doesn't confer righteousness, Being money doesn't, be, having money doesn't make you a great person, it just means you have money. Not having money doesn't make you a lesser person, it just means you don't have that money. And for sure it doesn't, like, it doesn't give you righteousness. It doesn't give you good behavior. And James tries to point that out. He's like, look, look where the bad behavior is. Are the, are the rich treating you well? No, they're not. It's not making them righteous. You might be saying, this is the person to emulate. This is who I want to be. But under the criteria of faith... It's not doing anything special. And you'll find this repeated over and over and over again. Who does James say are rich in faith? He says it's the poor. And we can see that this is not, this is just describing something that historically is true. He says, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? And I really get the feeling that James here is drawing on the teachings of Jesus. In the book of Luke, 
Luke gives a section, a section uh, which we often call the Beatitudes, made famous in Matthew. But in Luke's gospel, he gives two sides. He gives a side of blessings and he gives a side of woe. And he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. I think there are two ways that we can take this. One is to say God is only offering his kingdom to some people. And I believe that's the wrong way to take this. The other way we can take this is God is offering his kingdom to everyone. And some of us will be in a position where we're well positioned to receive it. And some of us will have challenges with that. Because to those who are poor, the kingdom of God will come as great news and they'll say, what do I have to lose that's better than this? But there's a temptation for those who are rich and for those who are comfortable to say, what I have is better and I don't need to seek this new identity because I'm doing pretty well in the game and I want to see, you know, can I do better and, and I want to win and I want to win the game. But winning the game for James is realizing it's all about what God has done for us. It's not what we do for ourselves, we can lay that down, but it's all about what God has done for us and who he's making us. And when we talk about faith, we talk about our ability and our capacity to grasp what Jesus has done for us. This leads us to the third aspect of our new identity, is that we're called to be fragile, not false. I realized after the fact, I could also have said we're called to be fragile, not fake. Now, because I know there's absolutely no one who's fake on the internet today. I have, after spending, I've spent a lot, a lot of my life browsing the internet, and I can tell you there are no fake people on the internet. There's no fake news on the, no. We know that there's, there's so much that's fake. Um, there's so much that's false. Let, but let's look at what James wants to say about, um, about this. Let's read the scripture together. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. But if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is, with own, is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And when I say that we're called to be fragile and not false, I guess the way that I would think about it is we like to try and play the game by our own rules. Right now, the, the European football championships are going on. And um, it's, the, it's the global football where you kick the ball with your feet. But I couldn't help imagining what would happen if you took a North American, an American football, like a, a running back, like a fullback, a 300-pound guy, and you plonked him into the middle of the European championships. Man, he would destroy his team would win by record score. It would be amazing. He would be unstoppable. The guy is 300 pounds. He'd just pick up the ball, tuck it under his arm. There is no one 
I tell you, Jordan Pickford, the English goaltender, could not stop him if he had a week. He'd get injured trying, he'd break both his arms, he'd wrench, dislocate his shoulder. That running back would destroy the entire 11-man team. He'd run right through them. But wait, he's not allowed to use his hands, and he's not allowed to initiate that kind of contact. Those are against the rules. If you can play the game by your own rules, winning is really easy. And that's what we tend to do when we interpret God's law. Because we have this huge blindness to our own faults and our own failures. And it's our blindness to our own faults and our own failures that allows us to judge others. And to say, you don't deserve to be loved, but I do because I'm better than you. Because I don't have those problems. But when we do that, we're ignoring our own problems. We're saying, I can run with the ball in my hands and I'm doing great. And those blind spots are different for each one of us. And James wants to bring us back and say, look at the number one commandment to love. The number one commandment is to love. And God's rules, in a way, are very, very simple. God will forgive us so many things. God will bear with us patiently in so many areas. But he will forgive so many things and say, I'm going to love you, and the judgment, my judgment is satisfied by the death of my son. But, James is very, but God is strict, and James expresses it. He says, if you refuse love to someone else and say, you're not worth loving, and try and reserve that for ourselves, God doesn't have any patience for that. And so James comes really strongly, and he says, mercy triumphs over judgment, and you need to live this out. And of course, this is all grounded in our identity, our new identity that comes in our baptism. And James has a very, very simple check when he's talking to the church, whether this is happening or not. James is very practical. I, I imagine him as a plumber, actually. He just goes and says, this needs to be fixed. You got a problem here, you should fix it. Oh, I saw that issue, you got to plug that. And for James, the check is, what are you doing? He's like, you want to know if you have a blind spot or not? What are you doing? It's pretty obvious. Are you doing this or are you doing that? And so he says, check your actions. What are you doing? Because your actions always tell the truth. But it's not just that we have to do more in our new identity. It's that we're also free to do more in our new identity. When we're called to love, we also get a lot of freedom by letting things go. Because we're called to stop playing the game and we're call, and God gives us freedom when we do stop playing the game. And the more we stop looking at people with eyes of what can they do for me, the more we pray and say, God, all of these desires that I have, all of my hopes and dreams and aspirations, I'm going to give them into your hands in prayer, and I want you to show me how I can serve you by loving. The more we let things go, the less power they have over us, and the more free we become. And what this freedom winds up in, ultimately, is it winds up in us being free to give thanks and to praise God. The book of Revelation puts it this way in a blessing. And as we head into our baptisms and our baptismal testimonies, I want to share this blessing for them and for us as a church. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together.